Hello all, my name is Piotr Bojanowski and I have the great pleasure of uh, having, being here today with you uh, to talk about my work. I'm going to talk about uh, unsupervised representation learning with deep neural networks or how to train essentially neural networks when you don't have labels. It's a great honor to be invited here to the ghost day. Um, I've written on the slide that it's the 23rd of October and that uh, it's happening in Poznan. However, it's not the 23rd because this is a recorded talk and I'm not in Poznan, which is quite unfortunate. Um, it is what it is. I hope we'll have the opportunity uh, to meet in person in the future. Um, but let's 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 dive in the in the topic of this talk now. So I personally work on computer vision and over the last years we've seen amazing applications of computer vision uh, based on machine learning uh, working. Essentially systems such as this one or person recognition, uh, pose identification are working really well. They can do inference on, on really on small devices such as mobile phones uh, and they are all really the product of uh, great state-of-the-art computer vision systems. These systems, uh, in turn, are based on machine learning and in particular on the concept of supervised learning. Essentially, the fact that you have annotated data, which is comprised of uh, an image and a label, and you try to learn a function which will map from the image to the label set. This requires a large annotated set, so the number of such examples is quite large, usually n is large. And the second thing is that the label set, y, can be pretty complicated. So let's go through a few examples. Uh, in the case of classification, the label set is usually a binary set with 0 and 1. So let's have a look at the picture here. That's a picture of a cat, and the question can be here cat classification. So you're supposed to give a label which is zero or one depending on whether or not there is a cat in the picture. In this case, it's pretty simple. You just say one. This is definitely a cat. There are other tasks which require may maybe more complicated label sets. We can think of object detection where the label set is a quadruplet of integers which specify the bounding box around an object. And let's have a look at an image. In this case, the label would be a bounding box around the cat, maybe or not including the tail, which says where the cat in the picture is. So an annotator which would have to annotate this image would have to drag a rectangle around the cat. There are even more complicated tasks such as uh, object segmentation. So you are given an image and you're supposed to give dense annotation of where the object is. In this case, that would correspond to providing uh, a dense uh, outline of the of the object, such as this one. This kind of starts to to tackle the the, the problem of what is an object and what is like, the definition of an object, because when you need to annotate objects such as this one or this one, you start to think about well, what is the definition of the object I'm trying to annotate. And the second thing is that if you're faced with uh, an image such as this one and you're the annotator, you are just in complete despair because this is just very time consuming. You need to provide like the outline of each of these cats. So what happens usually when you are doing this is you just do something quite uh, approximate, uh, therefore annotate like adding noise to the annotation. Another topic tackled in computer vision is video understanding. Um, and the typical task that people solve on, on videos is action recognition. So you are given a short video clip and asked what is the action performed uh, in the video. Uh, so these are typical examples of a data set with actions sit down, sit down or stand up. Um, the label set in this case is like a finite set of, of actions predefined by the person setting up the task, such as sit down, stand up, open door, eat, hug, kiss, run, fight. Uh, the problem with this is that the definition of these actions may be very ambiguous. The second thing is that annotating video is particularly tedious. So like back then when I was doing my PhD, there were these tools which were very clumsy and very hard to use. 
which allows you to provide temporal boundaries as to when an action begins and when the action uh, ends. But the problem is that this definition of the action not only is imprecise, but also we don't really know when an action begins or when an action ends. I'm just going to give you an example for this. We're going to watch a clip. The clip was supposed to be annotated with the action eating. Um, and let's, let's think of what would be the boundaries for this. So like, there's a plate, there's a guy bringing the plate to someone. Okay. Is the eating action starting now when the plate is in front of the guy? Is it now that the guy touches the burger? Is it now that the guy actually bites the burger? So if you're an annotator, you're like really not sure what to do. So this is just going to generate a lot of annotation noise. So I myself have learned uh, how, this, how hard this task is uh, the hard way. So when I was doing my PhD, most of computer vision video research was reporting results on Hollywood 2, uh, which was roughly um, 2,000 videos annotated with 12 actions. Uh, the videos were pretty short, between 2 and 10 seconds. Uh, and the videos were taken from 70 uh, Hollywood movies. So my supervisors wanted to create Hollywood 3, which would be uh, fully annotated the 69 movies with the 12 actions exhaustively. So finding every single occurrence of someone standing up from a chair in the 69 movies. And I actually had to annotate some of them because uh, basically some of the movies had offensive content in them and some of the annotators refused to, 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 to do it. So I had to watch this movie Crash by Cronenberg uh, a few times, finding every time someone stands up from a chair or sits down. So this was really like I learned how annotation is a hard job uh, by just doing it. So then the question we can ask ourselves like why do we need unsupervised learning? I think unsupervised learning is exactly the answer to these problems. As I hope I've convinced you, annotating data is very tedious. The second thing is that the definition of the task really depends on the definition of the labels which is just said by the person in, like inventing the task. And then the annotators themselves have by annotation biases. As we've discussed, like the definition of when an action starts or when an action ends depends on, on so many factors and there's going to be huge uh, annotation disagreement between people. So I think it's really important to uh, train as much of the neural network as we can with only using the raw data and not the annotations. So I'm going to talk to you today about unsupervised learning, and I'm going to do it in a kind of encyclopedic way, trying to show you different applications in different fields where unsupervised learning can uh, go a long way, giving you good features or allowing you to define a task which makes sense. We're going to start by unsupervised learning of word representations. So a paper we did following up word to vec on trying to learn uh, word representations, word vectors without using any annotations. Second, I'm going to talk about unsupervised learning of image representations, how to train CNNs uh, to well represent images well, again, without using ImageNet labels. In the last part of this talk, I'm going to talk about like an opening, a new thing we are trying, which is unsupervised learning in the context of dynamic tasks. Essentially, when you're trying to do reinforcement learning, but you don't have rewards. OK, so this is the overview of the talk. And uh, let's jump right in into the first part. I'm going to start by talking about uh, our paper we did in 2017. So this is a bit dated, but I think it's still very valuable because the lessons learned back then are kind of still important nowadays. The paper was called Enriching Word Vectors with Subword Information, and it was a collaboration with Edouard Grave, Armand Joulin, and Thomas Mikolov. So before uh, going into the details, I'm just going to give you a bit of overview of uh, how Word2Vec was working. 
So Word2Vec defined two kinds of models to learn vector representations for words. One was named Skipgram, the other one was SIBO. Uh, both these models allow to train word vectors in a completely unsupervised way, just using text data. And I think it was one of the biggest breakthroughs of unsupervised learning in natural language processing over the 10 last years. So how does the Skipgram model work? Um, typically, when you have a sentence such as the following one, the mighty knight Lancelot fought bravely, and you have a word W, uh, you want to set up a problem where given the word knight, you will predict what are the words around it. So you given knight, you want to predict mighty Lancelot fought and bravely. So you're trying to essentially model the probability of a context word given a word an anchor word, such as depicted here. So if we define a feature for the word W, let's call it XW, and a classifier for a context word VC, we can model the probability of a context word given a, uh, an anchor word, such as this one, by taking simply the softmax of a linear function. So you take the dot product between XW and VC, and do a softmax over this, uh, over the vocabulary uh, as follows. And then once you train this model on a huge corpus, the word vectors are going be, to be the XW. There's a second model which was defined in uh, Word2Vec, which was the SIBO model. It's similar to the previous one. So let's take the previous sentence again, the mighty knight Lancelot fought bravely. And in SIBO, the concept is that you take the context of the word and you try to predict the anchor. So you pro model the probability for a word given the context. You can set that up again by defining a feature for the context, defining a classifier for the word, VW, and modeling the probability of the word given the context as the exponential of uh, the representation of the context dot product with the classifier for the world. Once you are done with this, you obtain word vectors again. And the SIBO model comes from continuous bag of words, in the sense that you're kind of doing bag of word representation of the context. So the representation of the context is essentially the sum of the features of words in the context and the word vectors you have at the end are the, the, the XCs. So in the paper we did in 2017, we wanted to exploit subword information. This comes from the observation that uh, grammatical variations still share a lot of engrams. Uh, I think uh, most of the audience is Polish, and we, in Polish, we have the declension, right? So if you take the word university and uh, use the declension of it, you realize that you have uh, 14 words which have the exact same prefix. So uh, that's one. The second thing is that there are many languages in which you have uh, compound nouns or agglutinative languages. For instance, in German, uh, if you take the word Tisch, which is for table, you take tennis, which is tennis, then tisch tennis is essentially table tennis, which is ping pong. Makes sense. So it, when you build word vectors, you would like to have a system which will exploit the morphology and use character sequences to represent the words because there's so much redundancy there. So what we propose there is to represent the word using the character engrams in the world. So if you take the word ananasek, you would represent it as the sum of all trigrams, all four grams or five grams, and maybe even all six grams. And uh, we can add special positional characters at the beginning and end of word, uh, therefore giving a special meaning for prefix and suffix. So in the case of universitet, beginning of word univer is going to, uh, to have a special meaning, whereas like tet, tetu, tetovi, tetem, tetche, are going to be uh, special uh, sequences too. So what model can we use to train when we represent words as 
uh, we just described. We use the skip gram model and try to model the probability of the context word given the word. In that case, the feature uh, of a word would be HW and the classifier for word in the context would be VC. And we would model, as I've described at the beginning, the probability of the context given the word as follows. The main difference with skip gram is that the feature of the word is computing using the n-grams. So HW for a word W is essentially the sum of all the XG and XG is the sum of the word vector itself for the word mangeret and all the character n-grams which constitute the word. The big advantage of this model is that it handles out of vocabulary word. So it is possible now to get word vectors for words you have not seen during training. Because you represent a word as the sum of n-grams and in the out of vocabulary word case, you won't have the word itself. You can still use the character n-grams to build a word vector. So this is very useful in applications with very large vocabularies such as pharmacological data and it also allows you to train on much smaller uh, data sets. So how do you evaluate the quality of word vectors you train? There are many ways to evaluate them and uh, two of them are called uh, intrinsic evaluations. The first one is word similarity. So you are given pairs of words and you ask for a human judgment of similarity. So if we look at these words, uh, the annotators were given these pairs, yodeling and singing. And on average, uh, the annotators have said that uh, they are similar up to 7.5 on a scale of 10. Now, if you are given these pairs, you can also compute similarity given the word vectors you just trained by computing the following similarity, which is essentially just the cosine between the two vectors. And then if you have your similarity obtained with your model and the similarity given by the annotators, you can compute the Spearman rank correlation between the two and you get the following table. So SG and SIBO are the versions that you had in word to vec and SISG is subword information informed skip gram, so our model. And we see that the model we developed with the character n-grams was really, really useful for morphologically rich languages. You see that for uh, Russian and German uh, or even Arabic, uh, our model works really well. A second kind of evaluation is on word analogies. And word analogies are essentially tasks where you're given a triplet of words Paris, France, Warsaw, and you're supposed to predict the analogy. Uh, in this case, of course, Poland. Uh, and you are given lists of such uh, analogies uh, just created automatically from seeds. And the model is supposed to predict the analogy. So you compute the word vector France minus word vector Paris plus the word vector Warsaw and you compute the accuracy of how often did you predict the right word for the analogy. So we do that for our model, again, comparing to Skipgram, SIBO, and our model. Uh, and we show that uh, our model was working really, really well on syntactic analogies. Syntactic analogies being the ones which are more on the grammar rather than the semantic of the, of the word. And what's interesting is that even though we get very big gains in syntactic, we don't lose much on the semantic front. So we also had to do our due diligence and compare to previous world, uh, work, essentially models which trained word vectors which were informed of the morphology. And we basically show on all uh, benchmarks that our mod uh, model was working uh, much better. The interesting thing I mentioned before is that because we exploit redundancies in the data much better, uh, our model allows to train much, much faster. So uh, we look at the subword information skigram red, which is our model, and we compare to SIBO and uh, subword information skigram. And we show that uh, since we exploit the, the redundancy much better, 
it's okay to train on 1% or 2% of Wikipedia and we're going to get good word vectors, whereas the SIBO and SkipGram will require a lot of data to get good performance. So these are just some qualitative results we obtained with the word vectors and uh, looking at the dot products between the character and grams. And we see that uh, in the case of the dot products between the, the n-grams in rarity and scarceness, we have high dot product between the n-gram rarity and scarce, and high dot product between et and ness, which makes sense. A second example is matching the word chip to microcircuit, as chip is essentially matching to micro and both circuit, but not match to ROS circ. Uh, here are some just nearest neighbor queries showing that uh, essentially the, the nearest neighbors we obtain in the case, for instance, of uh, micromanaging uh, are closer in meaning to what we would get with Skipgram because they share a lot of uh, suborbs. So one of the most important parts of, of, of this was, was the training data used. So even though we compared uh, all previous methods on training on Wikipedia, we realized that for some languages, the, even Wikipedia is not enough. Uh, so Wikipedia data is of high quality, but it's often not there for many languages. So we had this idea to train our models on a lot of noisy data. So if you look at the, the number of words you get on Wikipedia and compare this to the amount of words you could get from crawl, you really see that for languages such as uh, Chinese or Czech, you're going to have much, much, much more data if you use crawl. So we built a language identifier. Uh, and why do, did we need a language identifier? It was to split common crawl by language. So we just designed a very simple language identifier, which was taking a character engrams, doing a bag of word and a linear model on top. Uh, so, thanks to that, we were able to detect 176 languages in common crawl. And when we compared it to uh, the open available langid.py uh, language identifier, we actually had good performance uh, with lower uh, runtime. So, by, by using more data and uh, adding a few improvements, in 2018, we released uh, better models. And here is just the breakdown of all improvements. Uh, I think the, 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 the most important part was the fact that we used the common crawl, which allowed us to get much better performance for languages where Wikipedia, even though it seems quite big, it's still quite small compared to, to English, for instance, uh, therefore bumping up the performance by uh, a few percent on Polish, Hindi, or Czech. So, uh, this closes the first part of the talk, which was about how to train word vectors in an unsupervised way. And I would just like to talk about the key takeaways here. First, uh, I think word to vec and the follow-up work we did here was one of the great examples of unsupervised learning from language. Uh, it has really revolutionized uh, the way natural language processing was working. Uh, nowadays, of course, these things have changed because like, people use language modeling and bigger models to do that. But I think the core idea, which is using language modeling or context prediction as a task to train neural networks, is still there. Essentially, language modeling, the fact of predicting uh, words in a sentence, is really the perfect self-supervised or unsupervised training task. And as I told you, uh, the modern models such as BERT etc., uh, they really rely on the same principle. And I think here, the, 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 the core of the work is what kind of architecture you should be using uh, together with this language modeling objective, uh, because this is the core uh, of, of, of the modern research in this area. With that said, uh, this is closing the first part of the talk. Uh, and I'm going to now uh, present to you uh, something different. We're going to talk about how to uh, train convolutional neural networks without using uh, supervision. This is joint work with Mathilde Caron, Ishan Misra, Julien Meral, Priya Goyal, myself, and Armand Joulin. This is a paper we submitted to NeurIPS this year. Uh, 
which was called Unsupervised Learning of Visual Features by Contrasting Cluster Assignments. So, um, why do we do that? Why do we want to pre-train uh, image features in a self-supervised way? So, usually, when you face a computer vision task, you have a network with random weights. You're going to pre-train the random weights on a, on a task. This usually is done on a task such as ImageNet, so a very large collection of annotated data. And then you have your task of interest, and you're going to fine tune the weights of your convolutional neural net uh, on this task. So uh, this is the part we are interested in, the pre-training. <coughs> and uh, the fine tuning in this work is used essentially as an evaluation method. So the pre-training, we want to do it in an unsupervised way, so do it on data which is out there, but removing the labels. So instead of taking annotated data from ImageNet, we just take a huge collection of data which can come from anywhere because we don't take care about the annotations. Essentially, if you think about it, what you want to do is to train a network which, given some input images, will be able to organize the feature space in a continuous and smooth way. For instance, in this case, the meat hedgehog and the hedgehog will be in different parts of the feature space uh, and uh, images from with similar content will end up uh, together uh, in the feature space. So what are the different methods to do these kind of things? Um, it's usually self-supervised learning. So what is self-supervised learning? Uh, it is uh, training networks based on fake labels. So instead of having like a real supervised criterion, you invent a labeling procedure, which from the data will extract some uh, labels. Once you have this procedure, you end up basically doing the supervised learning again. So you just minimize an empirical risk with the label being something you extracted from the data itself. Um, let's maybe just have an overview of what would be the related works in this context. And the first thing that people have tried uh, in this space was handcrafted pretext tasks, such as image colorization. Or uh, the second area was contrastive learning, essentially saying that I'm going to do instance classification and just two augmented versions of the same image should be the same class. Or methods based on clustering. So there are some methods which I won't talk about in this in these presentations, which are generative models and latent variable models, or many other approaches which are not really in the scope of this talk. So just to jump maybe straight into the self-supervised pretext tasks, initially people have tried to, to set up these kind of tasks from the data. An example is object tracking in video. So you track an object in the video and create pairs of patches within the same track, different track, and learn a function such that patches from the same track are going to be together and patches from different tracks are going to be far away. Another example is the work of Dorschetal, which was about modeling the context. Uh, a bit like in the Skipgram model I mentioned in the beginning, where you create pairs of patches, which will be labeled by the relative position, and you train a network to predict uh, the rel relative position of two patches in an image. The third and maybe most self-explanatory uh, task was colorization, where you would convert images to LAB, discard the color, and train a network that takes uh, the luminosity as input and pred predicts the colors. By solving these tasks, people have observed that the networks had actually good representation properties. I myself uh, was working more on the clustering direction. So in clustering, you take your, some data, you take your network, pass the data through the network. That gives you features that you can then do clustering on. And then you can use these clusters as a task to learn classification. And by alternating these two procedures, you end up learning a good network. And here are some examples of works that, that were using this principle. The third uh, 
line of work in this direction is based on contrastive learning. And contrastive learning is essentially uh, saying that if you take two data augmentations of the same image, so let's think of it as two different crops, you treat the two data augmentations as a positive pair, essentially saying they should be together, and you consider all the rest of the world as negative pairs. And you can formulate a classification objective with this uh, principle. So methods based on this principle are the following. Uh, there's more, but these are the most important works that, that exploited this idea. In our work, we wanted to uh, train embeddings with the idea of consistent cluster assignments between views of the same image, essentially trying to bridge the gap between the clustering ideas and the contrastive ideas. So how does the, our method, which was called SWAV, coming for swapping assignments between views? We take an image, generate two data augmentations of the image, we pass it through a network, obtain two embeddings, two cluster assignments. Wait for the video, okay. We obtain two cluster assignments for these embeddings. We swap the assignments and use these assignments for pre predicting. The second contribution we had in this work uh, was the idea of multi-crop. So uh, the idea here is instead of taking just two crops of an image as it was done before, we proposed to take many crops in the image uh, at different scales potentially and using all of them in the prediction step. So uh, if we compare uh, methods, even previous work for which we implemented this multi-crop uh, data augmentation, we realized that the data augmentation procedure actually allows to obtain a huge gap, like a huge uh, improvement in performance, essentially in two, for 2% 2 uh, for the SimCLR method and 4% for the deep cluster V2 or SWAV model. So if we look at the performance of the, the features we train with SWAV uh, on ImageNet top one, so we train our network in an unsupervised way on ImageNet and then train a linear classifier uh, on these features on ImageNet, on the labels, and check what is the performance. Uh, the performance of SimCLR, so a method published last year, after 40 hours of training reaches roughly 69%, where the supervised training on ImageNet is usually 76 and, and a point something. If we take SWAV, our model trained only for six hours, we already beat uh, the, the, the numbers reported in SimCLR. And when we train our model for 50 hours, <coughs> we see that we obtain much, much better performance, bridging the gap with the supervised models uh, quite significantly. What is most in interesting is that if we take uh, the, the features we trained in an unsupervised way and really do what was most important for us, essentially evaluating them on some downstream task, we see that the performance we obtain is actually better than the one obtained with uh, supervised pre-training. So just to recap, the green plot here is pre-training and CNN on ImageNet with the labels, really just doing classification with the 1000 classes then freezing the convolutional layers and doing linear classification on places 205, iNaturalist or uh, Pascal VOC. And uh, orange is our method trained in an unsupervised way on ImageNet without the labels, freezing the convolutional layers and then evaluating on the, on the supervised task uh, on places uh, 205, iNaturalist and uh, VOC 2007. What we see is that the improvement brought by our method is actually quite significant and uh, our features work better than the ones you would obtain with supervised training. So if you are trying to work on, on some uh, downstream application, uh, it's quite easy to use our network. It's available on the Torch uh, model hub uh, 
And once you have imported torch, you can just do torch hub load, the name of our model, and you have your weights, which may work better than the supervised ones on the task you're interested in. I really invite you to, to try these out and give us feedback if you have some. So what are the key takeaways of this part of the talk? We have discussed the model we have proposed for NeurIPS 2020, which was a mix of contrastive and clustering. Um, we have also discussed the fact that clever data augmentation can be very effective. And we've actually observed that uh, having good data augmentation strategies is usually more efficient than improving the model and that the core of the of the performance comes from effective data augmentation. We have shown that uh, modern self-supervised features, they work really well because we bridge the gap with the performance of uh, ImageNet pre-trained features. And we've shown actually that on transfer tasks, essentially on data, which is not in ImageNet, uh, the features we train in an unsupervised way, they outperform the features trained in a supervised way. This kind of goes in the direction of what we mentioned in the introduction, that human annotation contains noise, and this noise is reflected then in, uh, in just training features, which incorporate this noise as part of the model. Training in an unsupervised way, taking only the data as input, uh, allows you to alleviate this problem of uh, annotation noise and therefore giving you better transfer performance. This uh, ends the second part of the presentation and I'm gonna now uh, jump into the third part which is about unsupervised learning uh, in dynamic environments. This is joint work with uh, Lina Mesgani, uh, signed by Arsouk Batar, Arthur Schlam, uh, Armand Joulin and myself. Uh, this is uh, around the paper we published uh, in 2020, actually published on archive, um, and called Learning to Visually Navigate in Photorealistic Environments Without Any Supervision. So this comes from the fact, why did we work on this? In uh, Facebook, there is a group of people working on trying to build a simulation platform for what they call embodied AI research. Uh, this is essentially trying to generate, like write a simulator and a set of tasks, which allows you to solve tasks in <coughs> realistic 3D environments. Um, their approach is really like defining uh, the set of data sets, 3D scans, uh, like having a clear idea of what are the simulators that allow you to, to run these data sets and properly defining what would be the tasks you could solve on these on this, uh, environments. Uh, and this is essentially the effort of, of the team called Hab Habitat. So we thought we should try to work on, on this data. And uh, let's start with uh, discussing some of the tasks that people try to solve on the Habitat platform. Uh, the first one is called point goal navigation and point goal navigation is essentially the problem of navigating to a target which is defined by relative uh, gps coordinates you are given as input depth rgb and a compass which is you can see right now on the middle frame and the task is to really i'm sorry is the video playing yeah. and the task is to navigate to the red point so you see the agent manages to actually do that. And the difficulty here is that sometimes there are multiple paths that lead you to, to, the, to the solution. And uh, the challenge of this task is to find the, the most optimal way to the, to, the, to, the, to the goal. Here in blue, you see the trajectory taken by an agent and the green is the shortest path given by the simulator. So this is one task, but they also think of many other tasks in these 3D environments. Uh, and let's have a look at this video, which shows some of them. So they consider this task called object navigation, which for instance, the objectives given by a sequence uh, in language, go to or an object, go to the kitchen, go to the toilet. And the agent is asked to actually go uh, to this place. All the instructions can be given in natural language and you are supposed to follow the instructions to, to be successful. Uh, 
or even you can be asked questions. And then the goal is to navigate in the environment, gather some data and answer the question. In this work, uh, we were really interested in working on the brink of unsupervised learning, representation learning and control, essentially having to deal with the problem of data collection while trying uh, to train this representation and solving a task. So we focused on the problem they call Im image goal navigation. Uh, so this slide is taken from uh, Devendra Shaplot's work this year, where the task is given observations and given a target image given as an, really as an image, you are supposed to learn to navigate to where this image was taken from in the environment. So what we uh, took as hypothesis is that we want to train a system to solve this task without using extrinsic reward, without using human guidance or imitation learning, only taking visual inputs and working on challenging 3D scan environments of, of real houses. So how did we cope with this problem? Uh, we proposed a solution which was a bit hacky, but composed of three stages, essentially. The first one was training a representation in the environment um, and training a reachability network, which essentially gives you equivalence classes of locations in the environment. Once you have this, training an exploration policy without reward, which is just saying at each time step, am I in a new location? If it is a new location, you are rewarded. And once you have the exploration policy, you can sample goals from your exploration trajectory and learn an agent to navigate to previous points it has seen during the exploration. Let's go in depth about the three parts. So training a reachability network would be essentially very easy if you had access to the GPS coordinates. Uh, in our assumptions, we thought we're just going to use the RGB input and we don't have access to position. Therefore, instead of using the distance, Euclidean distance in the environment, we used as a proxy the distance in steps in a random trajectory. So we spawn a lot of random trajectories in the environment and say that if two states are close in the steps of the trajectory, they should be close in the representation. And we just train a network on data which we would label as on the left with just like a Siamese uh, convolutional encoder and a multi-layer perception on top. Once we have this reachability network, reachability network, we can define a scene memory buffer, which is uh, the following. We imagine we have a past memory. We obtain a new observation. We can obtain the max of the reachability between the memory and the current observation. And if the observation is different from what we've seen before, we add it to the memory. Otherwise, we just skip. Then we just define a simple exploration policy, which would be a memory network on the memory module with attention weights to the previous memory and a reward, which is plus one if we add something to the memory. That allows us to train the exploration policy. Once you have the exploration policy and you roll out the exploration, you obtain uh, an exploration episode with essentially a sequence of steps. Given these steps, you can easily sample a random point from the memory and set it as a target for navigation. And then once we have that, we can craft a reward, which will be the sparse reward of success. So if the reachability network says you've reached the point you've selected, you get a reward. We can also compute a nearest neighbor graph on the memory and use a dense form of uh, reward based on the reachability graph. So when we want to evaluate this, we evaluated it on the Gibson dataset using the Habitat simulator and selected large houses in this uh, simulator, essentially huge uh, houses in the US with usually have multiple floors and we run our evaluation on this. So to evaluate the navigation, we essentially compute the two metrics. One is the accuracy of how often do you actually navigate successfully? And the second one is the SPL, 
which is just a measure of how optimal your path is compared to the optimal path given by the simulator. We compared our method to a random trajectory and to a state-of-the-art model back then of unsupervised navigation, which would be called uh, SPTM, and to a supervised top line, which was trained with uh, actual reward. What we see is that our model was performing uh, really, really well on this task, especially when the dense reward was given. So just to break down these results a bit, uh, we've looked at the, the performance as a function of the distance to the goal and set basically different categories of difficulty. On the left, you see the counts, how many episodes of each type we had. So essentially, we had around 250 episodes where the optimal trajectory was between 5 and 10 meters. And on the right, uh, we show the success rate and SPL uh, of our method and SPTM for different distances uh, in, this, in, this, um, in these goals. What we see is that our method outperformed SPTM. That's the first observation. And the second one is that the, using a dense reward based on the graph that I mentioned before was actually working better than using just the sparse reward, which kind of makes sense and justifies our approach. Now, um, we may also want to evaluate the quality of the exploration phase alone. Um, and to explore, like to evaluate the quality of the exploration, we used a simple metric, <coughs> which was uh, essentially counting the number of cells that the agent visits when it does the exploration, essentially uh, dividing the map into squares of one by one meter and counting how many of these squares were visited. Uh, when we do that and compare to uh, episodic curiosity and to a supervised model, we get the following. We observe that uh, the coverage we get on average on the houses is much better than episodic curiosity, which seems to fail uh, in these visually challenging environments. And we obtain performance which is similar to the supervised baseline, which is trained actually on the coverage reward on which we evaluate. And here I show like just a graph that we built uh, that we built on the on the environment on which we evaluated. So the question is why does episodic curiosity fail like that? And we did an ablation study where we've seen that uh, <coughs> the main difference between episodic curiosity and our exploration policy was the fact of using binary area worlds. And we see that even though the coverage in meters for episodic curiosity falls to zero, the reward was actually maximized. And if we look at the qualitative trajectories obtained with continuous reward, we've seen that essentially the agent was going in a, in a, in a corner in which it was ob uh, obtaining a reward just below the threshold for adding a new node and just satisfying itself with that. Whereas when you, we discretize this reward, we obtain much better coverage. This evaluation closes the second, the third part of the talk. Uh, and here are some key takeaways on this. So I've described the model that allows you to learn uh, unsupervised navigation without any form of reward given by the simulator. So uh, we train an agent really without any extrinsic reward, only with rewards which were based on either previous experience or some form of, of uh, self, self uh, super, supervision. The key here was really having access to previous experience, which allowed you to sample goals. Uh, I think uh, there are some limitations of this work. For instance, the fact that this was really uh, in the context of navigation in environments where all actions are reversible and essentially the state graph is, is very well connected. So I think moving from here to a realistic reinforcement learning scenarios is quite a long way to go still. So this concludes the third part of the talk. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, finish with very uh, rough conclusions. And uh, I think we can open up the floor uh, to questions to myself, uh, with myself, who is not today, but another day. This is quite confusing, but let's do it. Um, so uh, just to recap the talk, uh, 
Uh, we've talked about uh, unsupervised learning, and I think uh, I've shown some evidence that it is possible to really train useful representations when you don't have labels. We talked about it in three different scenarios. The first one was learning word representations for natural language processing. The second one was uh, training uh, image representations in the form of a convolutional neural net. And finally, we talked about uh, how to train an agent to navigate in visual environments without rewards. The important takeaway is that using self-supervision or unsupervised methods uh, removes the need for labels. And because of that, uh, you have reduced noise coming from the labeling. Uh, the experiments on image representations have shown that you can get much better transfer performance when you train without labels. And the reason for this may be that training these models allows you to uh, avoid the bias in the annotations which is out there. I think there is still uh, a lot of research to be done on the properties of the representations you train without the labels. Uh, opening up, uh, I think, a really interesting uh, line of work around what are the biases learned by models in that case. That concludes uh, the conclusion, and uh, let's jump into conclusion into the question uh, that I'm happy to answer uh, another day than today. <laughs> Thank you all for listening, and uh, let's uh, go to the questions now. Thank you, Piotr, very, very much uh, for this very, very interesting presentation and also very compre comprehensive overview and uh, very instructive, uh, I would say, uh, when it comes to presenting both problems and solutions. So I think it's very useful for everybody uh, because they, they can take a direct uh, notes from this, how to apply uh, these solutions in, in their problems. Uh, we have uh, some questions, uh, so let me start from the question uh, that uh, have the most votes. Uh, and the question is, uh, some researchers say that new big language models, in a way, memorize patterns from the corpus instead of actually learning them. So uh, what are your thoughts about it? So I think it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, many people discuss this and talk about it. Um, I think it's worth thinking about like, what does it mean to actually learn? And uh, by that, I understand here, I think the fact that these models may not be generalizing enough. So I think the one consideration that like, can help thinking about it, at least for me, is thinking about uh, the most simple models you can have for language modeling, which is essentially trying to estimate like, what is language modeling. Just thinking about this, this is estimating the probability of the word at time t, given uh, the, the sequence that, of words that was appearing before. So the, the most simple model you can have for that can be based on counts. And essentially, if you have infinite data and you would have infinite memory, uh, you could build a table of the probability of word, I don't know, let's take a word like ananas. I don't know why I keep on using this word, ananas, given all the sequences of words that may have appeared before ananas in any corpus ever written, ever spoken by people, you would probably have a good estimate of what is the probability of this word appearing. Now, in practice, uh, the thing is that we don't have this infinite capacity. Uh, we don't have infinite data. Uh, so we are training models which try to factorize this model as much um, as possible, and we train it on finite data. So I would say it's quite normal that these models uh, do uh, remember, kind of uh, memorize part of the data. Uh, the, I think the, the real battle in language modeling is trying to have smoothing uh, properly, essentially being capable of representing uh, probabilities of sequences which are sparse. Uh, and this, I guess, depends a lot on the architecture. So I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, I think there's a bit of memorization, a bit of learning. I mean, learning is also about memorization in some cases. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, if uh, you have further questions, uh, there is a possibility to use uh, our systems to ask them during the conference, uh, I hope. Uh, 
so uh, let me proceed uh, to the uh, second question. <coughs> the second question asks uh, about uh, comparisons of fast text and uh, it is, are there any updated uh, evaluations uh, comparing fast text with word embeddings uh, from, uh, for instance, uh, BERT uh, or uh, from other transformer models? That again is a very good question. Uh, I remember that when we were writing the papers, uh, we evaluated the quality of our embeddings uh, compared to the embeddings you would get by training, uh, let's say, an LSTM language model. We didn't do that uh, with transformers. It's probably a good experiment to try. Uh, I'm just thinking that this is essentially like a curious thing to do because you would require a huge model which requires a huge amount of compute uh, to get things which are just the word vectors which are the embeddings uh, on the bottom of this model to do something with them. Uh, I think the spirit here was just to, to train uh, lightweight uh, word representations with a lightweight model that allows you to estimate these parameters properly on a huge amount of data. It's actually a good question whether or not by training these much, much more massive uh, models, you obtain uh, word vectors or word embeddings, which are good for downstream applications. It just seems to me like a bit of like taking, uh, you know, it's an, it seems like an overkill uh, if you just uh, think about the word vectors as what you need uh, in your application. Uh, because what's most interesting in transformer-based language models are probably the layers, the intermediate layers with the attention modules pre-trained uh, and not the word vectors. I don't know if that answers the question. If not, I can maybe answer later in the chat or something. Uh, um, okay, let's, let, let, let's, uh, let's move on and, and discuss later on the chat uh, as well, if, if anybody likes. Uh, so uh, now the question is about the first part uh, of your talk. Uh, and it is, uh, what do you mean by no extrinsic reward in point goal navigation training? Again, good question. I think it's it's a, a problem of, of semantics, the word I use to describe this uh, reward. Uh, I think it's the way uh, we defined it. Uh, we tried to define it in the paper. This was essentially the, the, the rewards that would come from the simulator and not self-supervised in the sense that they are not crafted by the, the agent themselves or by our model, but they come from the simulator. A typical example would be the coverage reward. So something where the simulator has to know your position, know the floor plan of the house and compute something based on this, which are extrinsic information for the agent uh, to, to compute the reward. So I think this is the definition we, we were thinking of. Uh, when we were saying extrinsic, in the sense that it's it's privileged information. If you think of a robot that would be evolving in a house, uh, this is the kind of things that would need to come from outside for the robot. Uh, thank you, Piotr. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, nearly about to start a coffee break, but I think uh, nobody uh, is forbidden to drink a coffee while I'm asking uh, the last question, uh, except maybe uh, us. But uh, <laughs> Drink for sure. I'm fine. <laughs> in a, in a, also in a minute. Um, so so let me ask this uh, last question. Uh, have you tried uh, the unsupervised learning with dealing uh, with dealing with the structure of uh, convolutional layers? So. Um... I think this question can be interpreted in different ways. The way I see it is, uh, okay, so first thing is that uh, we talk about unsupervised learning, uh, but the f thing is that you can think of like, for go moving from supervised learning to unsupervised learning, there are many things we can change. First is the data that we use, that whether or not we use supervised data. The second one is the kind of models we use in the sense of, uh, do we put some inductive, like some biases in the kind of models we consider? Or do we think of like multi-layer perceptrons without any assumptions on the connectivity of weights? And the third one is about the algorithms that we use. So in all the work we do, we kind of borrowed the architectures and the algorithms 
from supervised learning, where we know that convolutional neural, lay, uh, convolutional neural networks with SGD on ImageNet, they work well. So we don't use the labels, but there is a lot of the cooking which is there. Uh, so no, I think it's a great uh, question. Like, would it be possible to essentially discover these kind of patterns automatically? The fact that the connectivity should not be essentially all to all, but should maybe be something like the convolutions or maybe a generalization of this, or maybe some form of maybe even more complicated uh, architectures. I think like this is, I think, going towards uh, like unsupervised architecture search or like uh, structured uh, discovery. I think it's a very good question. We have not tackled it. I think it's still a very, uh, like, it's a very challenging research question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I see uh, there are uh, other questions, uh, but uh, maybe uh, um, I propose uh, that uh, uh, we can, uh, I mean, you, you can try to answer them on chat, right? Because they can flow, flow uh, or or, or you can, we can still answer this last one uh, for natural, non-natural images, uh, like medical images or any other very specific images. Would you advise to start with uh, ImageNet pre-trained uh, CNNs or rather pre-trained in an unsupervised manner? Uh, so, um, I can try to answer this. I think okay. this is. Uh, the, this is the really last one, and then uh, the, then we proceed uh, in the chat, and uh, we we have a coffee break, right? Uh, so well, let, let's give a give a chance to answer this uh, on the stage. Sorry, the, this resonates the, with the introductions we write usually for these papers because this is typically the kind of applications where you don't necessarily have a lot of labels, but you may have a lot of uh, unsupervised data. I think here the, the, the trade-off is that you need quite some unsupervised data at hand. If you have enough data which is not labeled, but you can still train uh, CNN on it without labels, it may be working better than pre-training on ImageNet, just because the data distribution is very, very different. So when you're going to be applying it then to, uh, let's say, medical images, you're going to be closer in the data distribution, essentially. So I would say, yes, it should work better, provided you have enough samples to train it on. Essentially, if you do unsupervised learning on 500 images, it won't work. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, OK, so now I will thank, thank you, thank you, and thank you three times, so, <laughs> or even uh, 100 and million times, uh, since, it's, as I said, we are really thrilled to have you here today. Uh, and uh, and I, I think uh, we can uh, close this session on the main stage. Uh, but uh, as I see, questions are, are flowing in. Uh, so so uh, you can, sure. if you have, if if you uh, like, you can answer uh, them uh, on the chat. Uh, uh, and sure. Oh yeah. Thank now you I, very much. We can finish. And uh, thank you a lot, Piotr, Thanks for this session.